Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, The Art and Folk Crafts of the Sanin Region of Japan. I'm Elaine Barron from Esprit Travel, and you might have heard about our event either through our mailing list or also through our curated Japan website and Instagram account, or I know Alice invited some people. So thank you to everybody who's here. I'm going to talk about a little logistics first while we wait for the last people to sort of sign on. We have quite a few people there, and it looks like about half are in. So um, just in terms of logistics, if you don't know Esprit Travel, we're a tour operator in Japan and we send people to all different regions of Japan. We actually have um, sent people to this region, but we thought you'd like to know a lot more about it. So that's why we arranged these presentations. Um, that's our role today. So for Zoom housekeeping, I just wanna mention a few things, which is that first of all, this is a webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So that means you're not on camera, no one can see you and automatically you're um, quiet. In order for us to address any kind of questions, you'll see a question and answer button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So you can put a question in and then Nancy and I will be moderating that towards the end of the session. And then our panelists today are going to be, Nancy and myself will be kind of managing everything. And I think at this point, if uh, Nancy, if you'd like to turn your screen on, I'd like Nancy to introduce the rest of the presentation. Welcome everyone to the first in a two-part series featuring the remote Sanin area of Japan. Our presenter is friend of Esprit, Alice Gordenker, a longtime resident of Japan, who is a writer, filmmaker, and frequently advises local, local governments and tourist associations on the mysteries of foreign tourists. In this case, um, this webinar has been sponsored by the Sanin Tourism Association. Tonight, Alice will highlight the culture and landscape of Shimane on the Sea of Japan. Whether you have visited the area on past Esprit tours and would like to delve deeper into this fascinating area, or this is a completely new part of Japan for you, there is much to learn. So Alice, welcome. Can everybody hear me now? Okay, I'm gonna start yes. on the, okay, very good. Thank you for that. Um, so <clears throat> thank you very much for that introduction. Um, Nancy, I have been living in Japan for nearly 25 years and have traveled truly all over Japan as part of my work as a journalist and travel consultant. Hey, Alice. And in, yes. Did you turn your video on too so we can see you? Yeah, I don't know how to do that. I'm not seeing any option to do that. The little start video button on and off at the bottom. I can't welcome. see that, unfortunately. Okay, well, I guess can you have your picture. <laughs> can you start me maybe, if I, let me just look at view options. No, I don't see myself at all. Yeah, okay, here we go, thank you. How's that? <laughs> Looks good. Okay. Um, so in this two part, series, I'm going to be introducing a part of Japan that I like very much, which is the Sain region. And it's made up of two neighboring prefectures. And because I love art, and I know that Esprit's clientele loves art as well, I'm going to be focusing mostly on museums and traditional arts and crafts. Uh, I wish we could cover everything. There's a whole lot more that we could be doing, but this is basically just a little curated taste of what you might be able to experience if you do go to sign. Let's get oriented first. I'm going to try and bring up the next screen, which is a map. There we go. Okay, good. Um, Shimane and Totori are located on the Japan seaside of Japan in what's considered the west of the country. Now, I found that most people are not familiar with the term sign-in, so I want to explain that a bit. Japan is divided up into regions, um, which is a division different from the prefectures, sort of the legal division. It's kind of like if you were talking about the United States and you say Michigan is a state, but it's also part of the Midwest region. And people in Japan do use these names, so it's kind of handy to know what they are. Um, Tokyo and Yokohama, for example, are part of the Kanto region. Most people know that one. Kansai, and Kyoto and Osaka are part of Kansai, and that's why the airport in 
Kansai is called, in Osaka, is called Kansai International Airport. And the Sain region is Shimane and Totori. Um, if you look over to the right, you can see that there's the Oki Islands um, in Shimane. They're actually, this is, you know, how kind of like Hawaii gets separated off the map. They're actually over here um, on the west of, off the coast of Shimane. And these are really beautiful islands. They're really interesting geologically and culturally. I'm not gonna cover them today. So I just wanna apologize for that in advance. The Oki Islands are important, but we just don't have time. And I think we could do a third session just on the Oki Islands sometime. Now you may already know some places in Sain, even if you didn't really connect that they were in Sain. I'm gonna go sort of from um, top to bottom here on this map. You probably have heard of the Totori Sand Dunes. Um, going to Matsue, the next place, if you know about Lafcadio Hearn, who is um, a writer who is famous for translating Japanese ghost stories into English, you'll know something about Matsue. Izumo is famous because one of the most important and most beautiful shrines in Japan is located there. And I know we have a lot of ceramic lovers in this group today. Um, Hagi is technically not part of Sain because it's over the border in Yamaguchi Prefecture, but this, you know, putting it on the map here helps orient you, I hope. Next slide, okay. Um, now, even if you haven't heard of these places, I probably wouldn't be mistaken if I guessed that very few of us have ever been, um, I'm just gonna go back to the next slide, the past the previous slide there, hold on a second, yeah, okay. Um, you know, Many of us probably have not been to Sain. Um, that's not so unusual. Even many Japanese people have never been to Sain. There are 47 prefectures in Japan. And in terms of population, uh, Shimane and Totori rank 46th and 47th, right at the bottom. And in terms of international visitors, again, they rank very, very low in the charts. Now, hearing those statistics, you might think, okay, if nobody goes there, um, there must not be anything of interest there. But really nothing could be further from the truth. This part of Japan is beautiful. The landscapes are amazing. Um, there's varied geology, topography and nature, and it's uh, rich in history and traditional culture. To understand why, let me just show you another slide. This is a um, gross, <laughs> simplification, but for most of Japan's long history, the country's exchange with the outside world was conducted mainly with or through the Asian continent, in particular with China and Korea, which were you know, relatively close. Um, until the 19th century, um, there was very little contact with the West, which was far, far away, sort of in the direction of those yellow arrows. Um, what I'm trying to convey through this very simplified presentation is that the Japan seaside of Japan, which includes Shimane and Totori, is where the action was. Um, this is where the trade opportunities were, where culture could flow back and forth much more easily. So what was going on in the Sain region? Well, in Japan's mythology, this is where it all happened. This is where the country of Japan originated. In Buddhism, Sain was an active center um, going back to the Middle Ages with several very important holy mountains with thousands and thousands of, of priests on the mountains. Mount Daisen in Totori is one of these. Uh, Mount Mitoku is another one. This is an ancient temple that's built right into the side of the cliff. Um, to this day, nobody, engineers, cannot figure out how a temple like this could be constructed with the technology that they had at that time. No cranes, right? Um, you will not see temples like this in any other part of Japan. They are unique to Sain. Sain was also an important center of industry and trade, very rich in natural resources. Um, the Iwami silver mines, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, was the largest silver mine in Japanese history. And it was active for almost 400 years from its discovery in 1526. The silver was of very high quality and it was traded throughout the world so that um, a spoon used by a Dutch person in a Rembrandt or Vermeer painting might well have come from Japan. And more specifically, it may have come from the mines in Sain. The Sain 
region was also an important center for steel production because it was rich in the iron, sand, and timber, wood, uh, needed for smelting. Japanese swords, which are loved throughout the world, are traditionally made only from steel made in this traditional method, which is called the Tatada method, uh, because it yields the strongest and most beautiful swords. Uh, thanks to these and other industries, there was wealth in sign and culture. The Lord of Matsue, for example, was a devoted practitioner of the tea ceremony and a great patron of the arts. Uh, in part because of his patronage, there are wonderful tea houses and gardens um, throughout Sain, um, as well as the arts that are part of tea culture, including ceramics, lacquerware painting, poetry, and highly refined cuisine and sweets. In more recent history, the Sain region was an important center for the Minge movement, uh, an early 20th century movement that celebrated folk art crafts and the anonymous artisan. I know many of you are very familiar with Minge. But getting to the Sain region is not difficult. Um, there are flights from Haneda Airport uh, in Tokyo, which take anywhere from 70 to 90 minutes. And there are special fares for foreign tourists, or if you live in Japan, you can get special package deals from the airline. So it's really not that expensive. Um, getting through Japanese airports for domestic flight flights is relatively painless compared to US airports. So flying is a reasonable option. You can of course also go by train. Um, and if you're visiting Kyoto or Hiroshima, you're already close to the Sain region. You can travel a few hours through beautiful countryside and yes, you can use a Japan Rail Pass to get there. Now in guidebooks, the top destinations in Sain are generally listed as the Grand Shrine of Izumo up in the top left, um, which is in indeed one of the most important uh, shrines in Japan, or below that the uh, Adachi Museum Garden, which is uh, a really amazing garden, and of course the Totori Sand Dunes. Now, these are certainly the most popular destinations for Japanese visitors, um, but what's most interesting for Japanese tourists is not necessarily what's most interesting um, for international visitors. You know, we have sand dunes in our countries too. Um, I will talk about these well known sites, um, but I'm going to focus more on um, lesser known places that you might not find in the standard guides, places that I personally enjoyed and that I think will appeal to customers of Esprit Travel. Today in our first session, I'm going to focus just on Shimane Prefecture and just on the main, the main what, what's on the mainland, not on the Oki Islands, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to take you along one possible route for say a three night, four day adventure and later in two weeks on October 13th, if you're in the US and 14th, if you're in Japan, I'll give another presentation on Totori and hope you'll be able to join us for that as well. Today, I'm gonna to start in a place called Yasugi because it's the home of the Adachi Museum of Art, which is justifiably one of the top reasons people go to Shimane Prefecture. And while this is an art museum with an excellent collection, the truth is that Many people go there first and foremost to see the museum's garden. Now, it's not an old garden um, like the centuries old gardens in Kyoto. Uh, the museum only opened in 1970, but it's a pretty darn amazing place. It's highly manicured, as you can see, and it incorporates all sorts of principles of traditional gardens, including shake, borrowed scenery, um, which is the principle of incorporating background landscape into the composition of a garden. And those mountains you see in the background, um, they are actually beyond the gardens, the boundaries of the garden. And look how well, how beautifully they've been incorporated into the entire design. What's unique about this garden is that you can't actually enter it. Uh, you experience the garden as you move through the museum, through windows and also interior and exterior corridors. So in essence, what you see is completely controlled, um, which is in and of itself um, an interesting experience and concept. And by the way, to achieve this level of perfection, 
the entire staff of the museum, right from the ticket collectors to the curators to the director, they spend the first 45 minutes of every workday outside all together, picking up leaves and any stray twig that might have dared to blow in during the night. The garden is definitely worth traveling to see. Um, I think everybody should see it once at least, um, although it's nice in many different se seasons as well. Um, but it would be a shame to overlook the art if you go. The museum has a very strong collection of Nihonga paintings. Um, as you know, Nihonga is a type of painting done with pigments made from crushed minerals and rock and executed on silk or paper rather than canvas. Um, the museum holds one of the best collections of the Nihonga paintings of Yokoyama Taikan, for example. This is another example of his paintings. That's Mount Fuji. Can you see that up in the top left? Um, that was, Mount Fuji is one of Taikan's favorite themes. He's said to have painted Fuji more than a thousand times. Um, I haven't counted them myself, but I have seen a lot of Taikan's Fujis. Um, the Adachi Museum also has a very strong collection of the ceramics of Kawai Kanjiro, who is a local son. He was actually born right there in Yasugi. But, but there's now another new and very compelling reason to visit the museum, and that is that they've built a new pavilion dedicated to the artist Kitaoji Rosanjin. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with him. He was a noted collector. Uh, artist and epicure who's had a huge influence on art and culture in Japan, uh, continuing long after he passed away in 1959 and even today. Um, our friend Robert Yellen, the noted ceramic expert, who I know many of you know, um, once described Rosanjin as boisterous, arrogant, and brilliant. And that pretty much sums up the man very well. Now, the Odachi Museum had a strong collection of works by Rosanjin, either made by or designed by him. Um, but in April 2020, so right at the beginning of the pandemic, they opened a brand new wing. Um, it's separate and newly constructed, uh, a building to better highlight the works. Now, I have not been there myself because of COVID, um, but it's killing me. I would really like to go there to see that. And as soon as I can get back to travel, I will be there. In anticipation of, of the opening of this new wing, the museum quietly embarked on a big shopping spree, acquiring a large number of new works. Um, so I probably should have put a question mark here after largest collection in the world. Um, their collection now amounts to some 500 works. I believe it's, if not the largest, then certainly one of the largest Rosanjin collections in the world, but it's certainly one place where you can go and see a lot of Rosanjin at once. And that collection includes not just ceramics, but also calligraphy, including these huge and rather impressive screens. The museum also has a nice gift shop, um, which is especially nice if you're interested in books and you want to be able to look through them, which you can do there. Um, you can find some books that might be hard to find, to find otherwise. Now, conveniently, right across from the hotel from the museum and i do mean right across from the museum there's a very luxurious beautiful hotel um, you can literally walk across the street to get there uh, i know that esprit has been sending clients there for some years now to um, rave reviews um, this sorry i should just go back one slide this uh, picture i took this picture um, it's of one of, in one of the new maisonette style rooms they have so that you have this private living room and off the living room level, there's this private garden with a private onsen bath. And then upstairs you have a separate bedroom, which is a nice configuration, particularly if you're traveling and have jet lag. I know that when my husband and I travel, he likes it if we have a separate room so that he can get up early and not have to worry about disturbing me. Um, the buildings and grounds are strikingly beautiful, uh, like this. And of course, the food is top notch and beautifully presented. Now, people often ask me what else there is to do in Yasugi other than the Adachi Museum, because it seems like a long way to go just for one museum visit. Um, there's lots to do. And one spot that I really like, and I don't think you'll find this in any guidebook, is a little soba restaurant near the train station. Um, there is a shuttle bus from 
the museum that goes to the train station. And uh, this is a, a soba shop, a nice place for lunch. Um, out from outside, you wouldn't think very much of it, right? <clears throat> Um, they serve Izumo style buckwheat noodles, which means a stack of layered dishes with separate portions so you can vary the condiments you add as you eat. Um, that's very tasty and a specialty of the area. Um, but for me, the big attraction here is that this small and unassuming shop was once a hangout for people involved with the Minge movement. And because of that, the place is full of amazing pottery and other minge themed objects. The tatami mat rooms on the second floor, they're just, it's like a little mini museum. There's Hamada Shoji plates just sitting out and calligraphy by Kawai Kanjiro's last student. And it's really amazing to sit there and eat your noodles in that environment. And if you ask nicely, they will let you handle the works. Another place that I like very much in Yasugi, so again, it's very close to the museum, is the Amano Indigo Dye Workshop. This is a long running family business currently run by this very friendly father-son duo. It's a long, narrow building um, going back all the way from the street with all sorts of different attractions. You can go past the little shop in front and go back and see the vats of indigo. These are, you know, living or living organisms. I, uh, this is the the son who's um, look at his fingers nails. They're permanently dyed blue from the uh, indigo. Um, I watched the father test the pH in the indigo vat by bending over and sticking just his tongue in <laughs> to make sure that everything was going right. They have to tend the pots constantly, so. Um, when anyone wants to travel, someone else has to stay home to take care of the pots. And anyway, you can go in there and see all this and it's a lot of fun. Their main business is threads. They dye threads in various shades of indigo blue for um, uh, that they sell to other artisans around the country. Um, but they do make their own nice collection of original items, which would make cute gifts easy to carry home and not too expensive. While you're there, you can also do an indigo dyeing experience, uh, dyeing a t-shirt or a silk shawl, which is fun and you can take that home with you pretty easily. Now, if you keep going to the back of the workshop, they actually have a much larger space where they make another product. Um, this is a traditional cloth, kasuri. Um, because the shop is located in an area called Hirose, uh, this particular type of kasuri cloth is called hirose gasuri. There's a sound change from K to G when kasuri is used in a compound. Now, what's really cool to see here, there, to see here when you're there, is the way they hand dye the thread to get the desired pattern. So here, senior is showing me um, a picture of the camellia pattern he wants to get. And in order to get that pattern when it's actually woven, he stretches out the thread on this frame and then um, marks it off. So let me show you, a, he actually wraps the threads in green plastic so that the dye won't penetrate there. Um, I don't know what they used traditionally before they had green plastic, but that would be an interesting question if we ever go back. Um, then when doing the, ve the weaving, um, he hand places the threads so the white parts line up in the correct pattern. And this should be a video so I can show you what he's doing. Maybe it's the next one. Let me just see. Yeah, okay, so here's a video. Let me just play the video for you. Watch how he's lining up the white color to get the right pattern and that he has to do this by hand. So he will gladly show this to you. Um, and the room is this huge cavernous room with all of this looming machinery that's like a hundred years old with this huge conveyor belt going. It, the noise and the sound in the room is it's just amazing. So it's really fun to go see that too. Now, just down the street, um, is another workshop that's really cool to visit. Um, remember that I said that the sign area was once a center of iron making. So there's a lot of traditional technology and craftsmanship in the area involving iron, uh, including knives, by the way, if you're um, a cooker and interested, if you're in the market for chef's tools, uh, Shimane is a very nice place to buy good quality Japanese knives. But you can go right into this 
workshop um, where they have a you know a fire a big fire going. It's like a black blacksmith shop. And in the front of the shop, they have uh, sorry in the front of the building they have this very nice shop where they sell their own designs. Um, they specialize in um, vases and uh, utensils for the for the tea ceremony, so flower arranging vessels like this. Um, and also anything having to do with lighting, including candlesticks and these beautiful um, and very stylish lanterns. I actually spotted one of their lanterns in the hotel that we talked about before across from the museum. This is their morning glory design. Maybe not the easiest thing to carry back from a trip, but certainly something to drool over. Now from Yasugi, it's just a hop, skip and a jump to the city of Matsue. It's about half an hour by car, a little bit longer by train. We talked before about Lafcadio O'Hearn, who was a Greek Irish writer who died in 1904 and collected all kinds of Japanese ghost stories and folk tales and preserved them for us in English. So he lived in Matsue for a while and wrote about it a lot in his books, which is probably how many of us first heard of Matsue. You can tour his former home, which is very beautiful, and there's an updated museum in the town to uh, museum to him in the town as well, which is worth going, especially if you like those stories. The main reason people go to Matsue is to see the castle there. Now, unlike many castles in other parts of Japan, which are replicas built in modern times post-war, this is actually the original castle, still standing. Um, and it's also unusual because it's mostly black. Most castles in Japan are white, so it's known as the Black Castle. You can go inside. It's quite small, really, compared to um, you know castles in Europe. Um, there's displays of swords and other artifacts inside, and you can go all the way up to the top where you get a beautiful view over the city and the surrounding areas. Um, Matsue is a very pleasant place to visit. It's a good walking town with lots to do, um, but maybe we're a little tired now and we'd like to have a break. So I'm going to introduce um, our first soft ice cream break of the day. Um, those of you who've traveled with me or follow me on Facebook, you know that I'm a big fan of Japan's amazing variety of soft ice creams, which are delicious and come in all sorts of special local flavors. Now, in two places in Shimane, I found this one. Wait for it. It's tomato soft ice cream. Um, it, I don't know how to describe it. It's a little bit like Campbell's tomato soup, um, but better. Uh, and there's a place right across from the castle that makes their own ice cream from their own tomatoes, which they grow organically. So a good place for a break. Okay, let's get back to work, however. Um, Matsue, because of that whole tea ceremony tradition, they have some lovely tea houses and gardens that, you, and all of this is walkable within the town. Note also that the city is located on a uh, picturesque body of water called Lake Shinji. It's brackish water, so half, half fresh water, half sea water, and raises some beautiful little local clams. <clears throat> the prefectural museum, um, which is located on the shores of this lake, is currently closed for renovations, but it's due to open next May. Um, and it's famous for its sunsets. There's one for you right there. Uh, the museum stays open until sundown, whatever the season, and people gather there to watch the sunsets. Um, before sunset, it's definitely worth checking out their collection. They have a very good collection of modern Japanese prints, Shin Hanga. I know some of you probably like that. And also Japanese photography. It's a very good place to see uh, Japanese photography, and it's certainly a good place for art lovers. Matsue also has plenty of opportunities for high quality, top quality lodging. This yokan is located right in the center of town on the river, and um, that's a very nice place to stay. But some many people also uh, opt to stay in the nearby hot springs resort of Tamatsukuri Onsen. So you've got lots of options. I'd like to move on now to Izumo, which is less than an hour away. Um, here again, uh, the main attraction is definitely the Grand Shrine of Izumo. Um, interestingly, this shrine is not so old. Well, it's very, very old, but the building itself is uh, relatively new because it's rebuilt every 60 to 70 years to maintain the powers of the gods. 
um, and to ensure that the traditional techniques of building aren't lost. Uh, this is a very special style of shrine architecture called Taisha Zukuri, which takes its name from this shrine and is used in other shrines around Japan as well. Now, if you're interested in architecture or mythology, I highly recommend that you combine your visit to the shrine with the nearby museum, the Shimane Museum of Ancient History, because it will fill in a lot of detail that you won't get if you just go and look at the shrine. And many of the major events that are retold in Japanese mythology happened in and around Izumo, and you can get a really nice overview if you add the museum in. Um, even for casual visitors though, people who don't um, study up in advance, the thing that really amazes everybody and always gets attention, and, and frankly, it for me too, um, is this massive straw structure that hangs over the entrance of one of the main buildings. Um, this is called a shime nawa. This particular one is so large that it gets the O in front. O means big. So it's a, but it's a shime nawa, the same kind that you see at other Shinto shrines and holy spots um, all around. It's used to demark sacred ground. But in Sain, they're bigger. This, this style is really um, quite typical for the Sain region, where they have much bigger shime nawa than anywhere else. And this style with these bell-like ornaments hanging down is, is what typifies the sign type shime nawa. Um, I went to see where these are made. They're, they are handmade from specially grown straw, and that's a really cool thing to do. This particular one um, weighs 4.5 tons. Now, many visitors to Izumo just go and take a quick look at the shrine, and then they move on, you know, they go to Matsue or something like that. But that's it's kind of a shame because there's a lot of interesting things that you can do in Izumo. Um, in particular, there's some amazing craftspeople within striking distance of the shrine, as well as some lovely small museums. For example, just a short walk from the shrine is the Tezen Museum, a museum where you can see the range and very high quality of local crafts. It's inside a restored sake brewery and shares the collection of an important local family, the Tezens. During Japan's feudal period, the, the Edo period, the regional lords were expected to send uh, good gifts of tribute to the shogun in the capital. And for this reason, they supported and maintained their own regional crafts and made sure that they were of the highest quality so they might impress the shogun. This is an example of the local lacquerware. Uh, this is a stacked wooden container which would have been used for presenting sweets and the design on the top is rendered in maquillé, which is the application of incredibly fine particles of gold and silver into the wet lacquer. This is just a beautiful piece and the quality of craftsmanship is just amazing. Um, also in the museum, you can see this little incense holder, which is for the tea ceremony, which is shaped like persimmon. And it's made in the local Fujina ware, which has this distinctive yellow glaze. Another museum that I like very much um, is the Izumo Museum of Quilt Art, which is the creation of a local quilter, Mutsuko Yawatagaki. Um, yes, quilting is a thing in Japan, although it's a relatively recent um, import, and Japanese quilters um, do some of the finest and most admired quilting in the world. The quilt show that was until recently held every January in Tokyo attracts quilters and fabric lovers from around the world. The museum is housed in a traditional old house um, and is very, very stylish. The, it's really got a Japanese atmosphere, even though it's all about quilts. For example, that screen that you see in the background, um, that's not a painting, that's actually a quilt that's been mounted as a screen. Uh, Ms. Yawatagaki works in uh, antique kimonos and obis, which she repurposes. And this quilt of Mount Fuji is made up of more than a thousand tiny pieces of those beautiful handcrafted kimono fabrics. The quilts are mounted as installations um, and paired with these very imaginative flower arrangements. So it's a really nice place to visit, also in Izumo. Um, let's talk about the Minge movement now a little bit. Um, I mentioned before that this movement celebrates simple but good design from unknown craftsmen, and it was in, uh, enthusiastically embraced in the Sain area. 
Yanagi Soetsu, one of the founders of that movement, traveled to Sain many times, meeting with local people and encouraging them to adopt the principles he espoused. In the early post-war period, these five young men, um, influenced by Soetsu, decided to set up a kiln, even though not one of them had any experience at all in ceramics. Uh, they did succeed uh, through trial and error and with support from various Mingay proponents from all over the country. And now their kiln, the Shusai kiln, is extremely well known in Japan and it's really popular with young designers and some of the big stores in Tokyo. So it's actually hard to get some of their products unless you actually go to the kiln. Um, they developed a beautiful blue glaze, which is known throughout Japan as Shusai blue. Uh, of course, there's a nice showroom um, and a shop where you can buy their functional and beautiful dishes. Um, they recently opened up both a clothing store and this really nice bakery cafe uh, just behind the kiln. So you can get a uh, really nice lunch served on their pottery there. And that's a nice way to sort of break up your day there. In and around Izumo, there is a rich culture of uh, crafts. Uh, so there are many other pottery kilns worth visiting and many other workshops. And one workshop that I really enjoyed visiting is the Nagata Indigo Dye Workshop. It's much smaller than the one we looked at in um, Yasugi. And here, what's interesting is that they're one of the few places in Japan that still produces Tsugaki Aizome, which is a form of dye resist. So, here you see the craftsman applying designs with paste um, and then the cloth is dyed and the paste is later washed out. And they used to wash it out in the river, but they can't do that anymore for environmental reasons. These uh, designs, they're all auspicious designs, lucky designs are really prized. Um, there you often see Nordian hanging curtains outside of shops. Um, and they're also very popular for the Fudoshki wrapping cloths, which are given as wedding gifts. They, these are not cheap, um, by the way. Um, that's Masao-san, who is a fifth generation artisan. He runs the workshop with his father and the two of them will greet you and show you around. Uh, actually, I see his father in the background of the photo there. Also, the, uh, there's like bicycles sitting around. So from Izumo, let's say we wanted to, to uh, explore further. You can do this by car or by train. Um, and you can see that from this photo that the trains are very local and picturesque and they run right along the ocean, the Japan seaside. And um, train fans, people who like to photograph trains or ride on trains come to this part of Japan just to ride on these trains. So it's certainly fun. So what can we find west of Izumo? Well, a big draw there is, of course, the silver mines I mentioned earlier, which are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's a lot of information available in English uh, on, about the silver mines, so I'm going to be brief here. But there is an interesting visitor center and a nice wooded walk up to the mines, um, some of which you can enter and, and tour. But what's especially nice um, about visiting the mines is that the old town that developed around the mines and the silver industry there, it's called Omoricho, is beautifully preserved. So as you walk through this town, you can really imagine what life might have been like several hundred years ago during the Edo period. And what's more, the town is the headquarters of a the sustainable design company, Gungendo. Uh, they make natural clothing and healthy food and Honestly, everything they do, they do with the utmost in style. I mean, look at that chopstick wrist. It has a little um, vessel in it so you can put fresh flowers in. That's the kind of thing they do. Um, their flagship shop is opened there right on the street. That's, the, that's a picture of the shop on the right there. And um, they also operate a very nice cafe for lunch. Gungendo, the kind of design company, has renovated several uh, Edo era buildings which they operate as guest houses. This is one of them. It's called Takyo Abeke. And I know that Esprit Travel has been sending guests here for many years now, um, again, to rave reviews. It's a very unique place to stay. I myself haven't stayed there, but I did tour it. Um, and it's, I took this photo. It's just you know, it's just beautiful. The, the aesthetics are gorgeous. 
This was my favorite room. Um, it's hard to tell from the photo, but the floor uh, is lined with custom made tatami mats that are just butter soft under the feet. And the aesthetics throughout the room and indeed the entire inn are really incredible. Meals are communal in an open kitchen with guests and staff interacting as truly gourmet meals from local products are produced before your eyes. Very nearby is the old hot springs town of Yunotsu Onsen. Now in olden times when the silver industry was active, um, the silver was sh shipped from the port there. And this is another little town that's beautifully preserved, although the style is the sort of the post-war Showa period. It's a lovely town to walk around because it's so quaint and photographers really love to come here because um, of this retro style and they like to take pictures. But the real reason I recommend going to Yunotsu Onsen is that every Saturday night they offer a performance of Iwami Kagura inside the local Shinto shrine. And Iwami Kagura is a form of storytelling that relates the myths and legends of Japan um, through dance and music. And Kagura is written like this, with the characters for God and entertainment. And fundamentally, this is something that humans did to please the gods, which is why it's traditionally performed in shrines. There are many different types of Kagura or shrine dances around Japan, but Iwami Kagura is unique. It's much more lively and entertaining, and it can only be seen in this part of Shimane. So this is what it's like to attend a performance. The shrine is a small space and you're very close to the music and the action. Most people sit on the floor, but you can get a folding stool if that's not comfortable for you. The stories are straightforward and easy to follow. They're epic tales of heroes fighting monsters and winning the hands of fair maidens. Um, all these dancers are amateurs. Um, they all have day jobs, um, but Performing in Iwami Kagura uh, is very important in the community with families participating together and good dancers admired and afforded high status. I have a short video here, which I'd like to show you. It's about one minute long. So you have the musicians performing live on stage there and here comes the monster, and yes, they do do use fireworks and sparklers. This is when the serpent is rising up and showing that the, there's one dancer inside each of those. Can you imagine if you're sitting right there and then this wall of moving serpent rises up? Not subtle, right? I mean, it's fun, lots of action, children enjoy it. Here's the god Susano, who's fighting the monster, which is called the Orochi, and figures in Japanese mythology. They're retelling mythology here. Things are not looking good here. I think he's gonna turn it around. He's got the special sword, yep. Okay, so that's one head killed. He's got more to go. You notice he's wearing a mask, right? Okay, so indulge me with one more video because, um, let's see if I can get to the next one. What I really love about Iwami Kagura is that the, the, all ages are involved. So I've watched this little boy, I've been to see Kagura here many times over the years and I've watched this little boy grow up. This was, you know, in way past his bedtime, and he was probably three or four years old when I took this video, but just watch how cute he is. You can also see how beautiful the costumes are in this little shot. there are all the monsters dancing. Okay, thank you for um, letting me show you my favorite little boy. Unlike no um, theater, which uses masks made of wood, which are quite heavy, the masks in, in Iwami Kagura are made of paper. 
And right in town, there's a workshop where you can see a master uh, mask maker, Mr. Kobayashi, as he makes his uh, masks. And he will invite you into the workshop. You can actually paint one for yourself if you want. Um, he'll show you how he does all his work. He's very friendly. And um, you can, of course, buy some to take home if you want. You can also go to the workshops. It's not far from town um, to see where the costumes are made. These costumes cost thousands and thousands of dollars because they're all handmade and the dancers pay for themselves or their troops do. Um, notice that the workers are all working on the floor seated on tatami, which is pretty traditional in Japanese crafts. Um, part of the reason that Iwami Kagura costumes are so eye-catching is that the designs are raised. Here you can see gold thread being hand-stitched over applique. And this is what the finished product may look like. And I don't know if you can see in this photo or not, but inside the eyeballs, there's little individual threads of green and red uh, threads to make the eyeballs look, um, what's that word, bloodshot. It definitely gives the tiger crazed look. You can also um, arrange to visit a practice session for Iwami Kagura, where the older members of the community teach the younger members of the community. I got a wonderful welcome. Um, I toured, saw, saw their own costumes and masks, and uh, even learned some dance moves. Now, Iwami Kagura is a real highlight, and you couldn't ask for a better high note to end a trip. It's a wonderful way to absorb the full culture of uh, of Shimane, but let's say you want to go down the coast a little farther. Maybe you want to go to Hagi, which is just a few uh, few hours more beyond you know Onsen. Well, where could you stop along the way if you wanted to? Well, one suggestion would be the city of Mas Masuda, and in Masuda there is a beautiful arts center which is designed by the world famous architect uh, Hiroshi Naito. Here's another view of that. There is a concert hall inside, and depending on what's on, you might want to visit a local concert. I always find it interesting when I'm traveling to other countries to attend a classical musical uh, concert, for example. Um, there's also a museum inside the Arts Center, and right now there's a Kawaii Kanjiro exhibit on. Remember that he's a local boy who was born in Sain. I'm almost done. Um, also in Masuda are two beautiful gardens designed by the famous uh, ink painter Toyo Seshu uh, from the Middle Ages. He came to Masuda when he was 59 and entered a temple. And while he was living there, he designed two temple gardens. Um, you can visit both of them. Uh, here's the other one. And it's really kind of amazing to me that these were temples that were designed in the 15th century and are still beautifully maintained. These areas, both neither of these gardens are ever crowded. It's not like the big gardens in Tokyo where you're um, you know, having to elbow past a million foreign tourists to see anything. You can really sit here and have a cup of tea and a suite and have the place to yourself to contemplate as these gardens were meant to be enjoyed. In terms of places to stay in Masada, I'm quite fond of this small hotel, which is, it's not fancy or expensive, but it's beautiful. It's all done in local crafts and local woods. Um, the rooms are pretty stylish. They have this really butter soft kimono here. Um, on the second floor, there's a uh, onsen bath with a little room full of art books that you can just sit and look at art books as you cool off from your bath. and. Take a look at this design, this uh, screen on the left. It's made of kumiko, which is joined wood. And I was so impressed by this that I contacted the craftsman who made this and commissioned um, some shoji screens for my house that my husband and I just built. Um, here's a closer look at that design. Um, I, I bring this personal note in just to show how it's really cool when you go on a trip and it inspires you to bring beauty into your own life. So I consider that a hotel stay well spread, spent. Um, that's all the time we have. So I'm going to end here. Um, what I've shared today is, of course, just a small taste of what you could be doing in Shimane. Um, but I hope it gives you an idea of what's possible. And do please try and join us for the next session if you can. Thank you very much to um, my clients in Sain for supporting me in this effort and checking all my work. I really appreciate it. And they will be here for the question and answer session in case there's any um, 
questions that I can't answer. So I'm going to turn over the program to you. Do I need to advance to the next slide? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, there you go. Okay. So Nancy and I are going to probably, uh, we'll moderate some questions. If uh, we have anybody, there's a question and answer area at the bottom of your screen. If there's anything that you're wondering about while Alice was talking, that would be good for us to know. Um, I think Nancy, um, why don't you start with uh, what you're saying? Okay, uh, well, it's not so much a question, but it's a comment. Alice, this seems like a, an extremely, almost mystical part of Japan. There's so much history and, uh, and mythology. It, it, and I'm just astounded. I've been to that to this, so this, this area four or five times. And I feel like now I, I have to go back because I ha I've just barely scratched the surface. And I, I just, I was so impressed by the purity almost of the architecture and, uh, and, the, and the beauty and the attention to detail. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I've been there dozens of times and I feel like I've just scratched the surface, but definitely my appreciation of traditional culture has deepened. Um, my appreciation of traditional crafts and arts has deepened with every visit. Um, uh, Alice, so one of the questions we had was that, you know, we talked a lot about the art and culture and can you tell us anything more about the food or food experiences in the area? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wasn't able to cover that or the beautiful nature. Um, if you come into the second session, I'll be able to cover nature a little bit more. But the whole coastline is absolutely beautiful. And um, because it's not as populated as other parts of, ch of town, the nature is um, really well preserved. And because nature is preserved, it means that you have a rich food culture, um, both from the land and the sea. The the whole Japan sea coast is famous for crabs in the winter. The season begins, I think, in November. Um, and um, there's also a local fish called the noro guru, guru, which I think is called the black perch, something like that. Um, but there's just all kinds of delicious food, not just seafood, but also um, lots. Soba is grown there a lot, so it's very delicious. You'll just, and of course, the sweets, if you like wagashi, Matsue is famous throughout Japan for um, wonderful Japanese sweets, which, and there's some places where you can see like a living national treasure making, making um, sweets right before your eyes and um, serve you them, which is really fun. That's in Matsue, right near the castle. And of course there's soft ice cream. We didn't even scratch the surface of the soft ice cream varieties. That was gonna be my question. Um, I certainly the tomato, uh, soft ice cream is unusual, but um, are there any other examples of wonderful? Yeah, there, well, especially in Totori, which I'll cover next week. Um, I'm going to save that for next week as a teaser because I've got, I think, three slides of soft ice cream for next time. So you'll just have to tune in if you want to know. Okay. And we have a question about uh, how many, the, the tour that you, um, the places that you described and highlighted, would it take, uh, you could do it in four or five days, but you would probably need to have some kind of private transportation to do that, wouldn't you? I think you could probably do that one without without private transportation. Um, that's Things are all pretty close together. You would probably have to take some taxis. Some of the places are not walking distance, but you could do this without a car. It's always nice to have a car in sign and it's not hard to drive there because the roads are not crowded like they are in other parts of Japan. Um, I actually finally just got my Japanese driver's license so I can do that. Uh, you do need to have either an international, you, you do need to come with an international license if you um, want to drive yourself, but it's easy to do that. Um, you can rent a car quite easily. And as long as you can deal with driving on the wrong side of the road, if you're American, um, it's fine. Um, Alice, what do you think is the best time of year to visit this area? Well, I think you, you know, like everywhere in Japan, every season has its attraction. The whole Japan seaside of Japan gets a lot of precipitation in the winter. It tends to be cloudy and you get either snow or rain. Um, so you might want to avoid sort of January, February, but I sent a group of um, friends who live in Tokyo to Shimane to do the Iwami Kagura and that the silver mines in December. Uh, and the weather was great. 
So, and they really enjoyed it. So really anytime, it's fine. Um, I think you said already that you're- From somebody who loves the outdoors and is a hiker, um, I, I think we, we could get back to people on that at a later time, but I'm, I'm assuming there are great places to hike and walk. In absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all, um, and also, you know, the whole concept of Satoyama, you know, the, 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 the woods that were close to people and that were preserved for harvesting um, wild vegetables and things like that. So there's lots of nature around and the coastline is absolutely gorgeous. And there's really interesting geology if people are interested in rocks. There's these like really cool rocky coasts with different kinds of formations that are quite famous. Um, this is Elaine. So one of the questions we had was, I think it's a little bit more for a spree type event to answer, mm -hmm. but one was sort of like, how is things, you know, moving around in terms of COVID, but also, mm -hmm. you know, is it easy to deal with things like food restrictions? These are questions that Nancy and I often deal with on a case by case basis. Yeah, I, I can talk, I can answer it a little bit. One thing about COVID um, that's really cool is that Shimane and Totori had the lowest rates of COVID of anywhere in Japan. I mean, our rates here were much lower than in Europe and America, but they were really low in uh, I think Totori had absolutely the lowest levels at all. And um, as terms of food, I deal with that a lot too when I'm bringing you know, groups of professionals around to look at things. One of the really cool things about um, Shimane is that there is quite a lot of shojin ryori, Buddhist vegetarian food available. You can go, so, so for example, if you go to the Adachi Museum, there is a place you can stay right in town. Well, first of all, if you're not gonna stay at the fancy, um, Sagi no Yu that, we, that I um, highlighted, right next to the museum also is a smaller, more modest inn that serves macrobiotic food, all vegetarian, all vegan. There's also a temple in town where you can go and stay in this, um, up in the hills, which is beautiful for hiking. I did a little hike after my vegetarian breakfast. So there are options. Um, otherwise, it's just like everywhere else in Japan, you have to work at it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I want to answer this question myself, which okay. is about the presentations availability. So about uh, usually three days after the event, we send out a sort of like a thank you reminder, and it has a link to a recording that we have on Zoom of the presentation. So you can watch it, you can forward that on to anybody at that point. So if you or you know, you want to have a family member watch this presentation, that'll be available for about another month on Zoom. And that link will be sent out in three days. So three, I always like to remind people because I start to get a lot of emails. So in three days, we'll send that out. And also, um, since you were signed up for this one, it's automatic for the next one. So you should also be getting reminders for the next session. And you'll get a one week reminder, a one day and a one hour reminder for those. So those are just some logistical things to handle. Can I quick hit, jump in and answer this question about the, how to get to the Yoki Islands? Sure. Uh, sure. Okay, there are two ways to get to the Yoki Islands. You can fly from Osaka. You cannot fly from Tokyo, but if you're in Osaka, you can get a flight. It's a little puddle jumper plane, um, very small, and uh, it lands on a very small landing strip. But most people go by one of two ways by sea. There's a slow, big ferry, which I think takes about four hours. Um, I love that one. Um, it's really fun because most of the ferry is tatami mats and everybody comes in and gets their pillow and their blanket and falls asleep. <laughs> uh, and the view is, if it's nice weather, you go out and deck and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, there's also a fast hydrofoil that you can take um, from the mainland. So those are the two, the, the options. It just, it takes a little work to get there and you have to be careful about the weather because if the weather is rough, if the seas are rough, or if there's a lot of wind, you may end up with a canceled flight or a canceled um, ferry. And people on the island are used to this, so they deal with it. But, you know, if you're a traveler on a tight schedule, it's hard to build the Oki Islands in. But if you have a little time and a little flexibility, it's highly rewarding. And maybe we should do another session just about them because there's a lot to say. And there's a brand new hotel there, which is gorgeous. Well, Alice, I'm sure you're seeing that uh, there are several people saying, when are we going? <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering that myself because um, I think for lovers of, of textile arts, ceramics, um, you know, 
it, it, it seems like it's an artistic dream. It's a dreamy looking place. So we, we've kind of got a ready-made tour right here, haven't we? Yeah. So let's just, uh, you know, for, for everybody who's interested in that, just stay tuned and we'll see what we can cook up. And we hope, of course, I know everybody's wondering when Japan will open up. We don't know. None of us know. Even those of us in the tourist industry don't know. We have no idea, but we're hoping that maybe the very end of this year or early next year, but we certainly hope we can welcome you here by the spring season. Right. And, um, posted about that. Yeah, so thank you very much, Alice and Nancy and everyone. Thank you for our technical staff. We had Danielle and David on the background here, just making sure everything went pretty smoothly. Um, we will be back in two weeks. You'll get an email in three days. And thank you so much for attending today. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. And thank you. Bye-bye.